Thank you, God. That's another day gone. And thank you I'm not sleeping in the cells tonight. You see, Ivan Denisovich, your soul is crying out to pray. Why don't you listen to it and set it free? I'll tell you why, Alyos. Prayers are like the complaints we make to the authorities. Either they don't get there, or they come back marked rejected. That's because you don't pray often enough. And when you do pray, you don't give your whole heart. That's why your prayers don't get answered. You must pray without end. If you had real faith, you can tell a mountain to move. And it will move. Come off it, Alios. You and all your Baptists, when you were down there in the Caucasus praying, how many mountains did you move? We didn't pray for that. Of all earthly and mortal things, our Lord commanded us to pray only for our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, our bread ration, you mean. You can pray as much as you like, but it won't take anything off your sentence. You'll have to sit it out from beginning to end. But you mustn't pray for that either. Why do you want freedom? If you were free, what little faith you had left would be lost in the turmoil. Rejoice that you're in captivity. Here you're free to examine your soul. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the goons to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings and welcome to The Anadromist. This is Burn Power, coming to you from Tbilisi, Georgia. You may not know where that is, but you should look it up on a map. It's not near Savannah. So, um, you may have noticed I've been taking a while to get to the next thing, whatever that's supposed to be. Well, what it's supposed to be is... Uh, number 11 of how we got here. And I've been working on it. And it's a lot of work. Because the closer you get to the present, the more you have that's crowding into your mind. Because you remember it's closer and closer and you remember more. So yeah, it's going to be an epic. But uh, one thing I should mention is uh, one of the reasons... Well, there have been two reasons I mentioned uh, one of them in my update... And that is that uh, I've been waiting for the resolution of the bank card fiasco, which you can go back and uh, watch the recent update, which <laughs> which is already seeming like a long time ago. But uh, the point is, is that uh, it didn't resolve till about a week ago. It took over two months for that thing to resolve. Talk about a nightmare, but I'm not going to go into that here. I'm I'm done. It's just a small detail that just happened to have wasted an awful lot of time. I had another funny thing happen today. I went down and I thought I owed a thousand plus lari for my internet. And it turns out that I was reading it wrong. Uh, and so rather I had put a thousand into it. Because the real price, a thousand would be something like three hundred dollars. The real price for what I owed, I, I thought I owed one thousand lari for the month, and the real price was twenty eight lari for the month, which is less than ten dollars for my internet. But meanwhile, I just been throwing money in there, so it'll be good for a year, and I'm upgrading my internet, which means once I get it upgraded. I might attempt uh, interviews and uh, live streams. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Uh, meanwhile, um, oh yeah, and the other reason why things got delayed was that I went through one of the pivotal experiences to prove that you live in Georgia. I had construction workers come here and take apart the wall that's behind me. Let me show you a few photos. I mean, basically it turned out that the wall was only this thin separating me from the apartment next door. So I could hear everything that happened over there. I'll let you fill in those blanks. Anyway, so they came and they did what 
uh, I mean, there's a universal way uh, construction workers take over one's house, but these were Georgian construction workers. So they come in, they don't care about anything. I mean, basically, I'm dodging to me. I wasn't sure what kind of a mess they were going to make. They made a really good one, actually, because uh, I didn't realize they were putting plaster on the wall. I didn't realize all this other stuff. So they built it up with these bricks that were supposedly soundproofing bricks, not quite as heavy as cement. And then uh, they just kind of plastered it all together. And in the end, uh, they they didn't sand it, but still, plaster got everywhere. And uh, meanwhile, they're coming in, they're smoking, they're talking, they're staying till whenever. And there's nothing I can say because they don't really speak English. So I can't go up and, you know, try to look stupid going like, you know, smoke, no, 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 that kind of thing. Um, they were friendly. I mean, they're Georgians, so they were friendly. But uh, <laughs> and I was I went in on this with the guy who lives next door, who's having them over at his house, finishing that side of it. Uh, and then in the end, I decided I want to paint this. And I painted it the way I often paint things, kind of <clears throat> purposely sloppily to create a bit of a texture on the wall. Because I hate this blank. Though There's nothing I hate worse than just a blank modern apartment with a white wall. That is just like, to me, it's like if I want to look at nothing but a screen, that's the wall for you, me. You know, it's just like you don't notice it. It doesn't exist. So I make walls... I can I can see. Okay, enough of that. So what we're going to do today, if you haven't already read the caption that you clicked on to get here, is we're going to do the third in my series of book recommendations. And this time, we're doing the fiction episode. Now, I've read a lot of fiction in my life. <laughs> so we're not going to go for, uh, you know, just like I've read a lot of books. I'm always reading books. But uh, what I'm not going to do is give you, you know, a big list of books. I'm just going to give you five, no, six authors and some of the books of theirs that really affected me the most. And one of the reasons I'm doing this is because if I wait until I finally uh, finish the How We Got Here, number 11, it'll be till next week. And I want to give you something. Also, we are coming very close to 1,000 subscribers here. I just reached 1,000 subscribers on my Gravity From Above channel that has stuff related to puppetry and dancing and music and all this other stuff. Check it out here. But, um, uh, and so I made a little video for that. That uh, took up some time. And you may notice I've put more material over there to take up my time as well, because I wanted to try to get the viewership up. By the way, if you want to help me out on that channel, uh, if you've already subscribed, here's what you can go do. Go watch a bunch of videos over there, because what I need is the time spent. I've got all, I've got enough uh, subscribers to get monetized. I don't have enough. Uh, uh, I, if it was a year ago that I reached uh, a thousand subscribers, I would have enough time. But right now I'm, less the time that I need. So any what you can do if you want to help, go watch some of those dance videos and puppet videos and interviews and things like that. That would help me out. Um, meanwhile, where was I going? Oh, books, right. So uh, these are books and authors that really mean something to me, but this is just fiction. There'll be a little bit of an overlap with the other two that I've done, but I just want to do this. And the reason I'm doing this is because it's relatively quick for me. So these will be a variety of different styles. I haven't tried to make them all of one style of writer. And in fact, what I did is once I, re I threw a couple of authors in there, I said, no, it's starting to look too much like a horror list or a fantasy list or a inklings list or something like that. I said, let me break it up so it's a bit here and there. So let's start with Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And of course, I've read almost everything by him except the really long series called The Red Wheel, which he hasn't finished yet. I want to read it once it's all translated. So I've got three of the, I think, five uh, different knots. And they're all huge, massive books. But I'm waiting on that. Uh, I hope to get it done before I die. <laughs> anyway, so a uh, very important book. His first 
uh, published work in the Soviet Union about 1961, I believe, and that was One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. It's a quick read. You can read it in about an hour and a half. I, I love this book, and I've read it many times. And the thing about this book is that it's just what it says it is. One Day in the Life of a Gulag Prisoner named Ivan Denisovich. And it basically, t you know, he, he goes through, it's a really cold day. He's trying to get things through the uh, security guards, a little piece of metal. He doesn't want to get stopped in the frisk. Uh, you know, it's like he's b working on constructing a brick wall, but he takes pride in his work. And he, and, and, uh, as he's going along, the Ivan Denisovich is saying, you know, once you start just living to survive, you're gone. You have to take pride in what you do. No matter, it doesn't matter that you're in the gulag. But near the end is where it really gets beautiful for me because right before he goes to bed, just some of his reflections on the nature of the day and stuff. And I think of people who live a certain kind of life where they want everything to turn out. And here's this guy on rotting straw in the gulag being grateful for the really small things of his life. And it's just an amazing moment. Uh, it just chokes me up thinking about it. And and I think about how spoiled so much of us are. You know, the, the big dreams we have. And it's just like, no, that's not the point. And I think that was the point of what Solzhenitsyn was saying in that book. Um, First Circle is also a very important book. It's about... Uh, the men who are in the first circle of hell, to use Dante's reference, and they're in uh, the best uh, gulag, so to speak. It wasn't really a barbed wire gulag. It was a place where scientists and mathematicians could work on a project. And the projects they were working on turn out to be evil Soviet spying and, uh, you know, just invasive, dangerous stuff. And uh, it's about the moral contradictions of what they're doing. And is it better to be sent back to the lower gulags and to the other circles of hell that are worse, or to keep one's and to keep one's integrity, or to stay safe and do this kind of work? Very important in our world today. Cancer Ward. This is perhaps my favorite of his novels, and. It's basically about a man who gets out of the gulags, which this Solzhenitsyn himself had ca cancer and was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, when he went into exile, because he was he didn't get, get to go home after the gulags, he was sent into uh, a town far away in Kazakhstan. And uh, then he develops cancer and has to go to a Soviet uh, hospital, which is none too clean or none too uh, modern. Uh, anyway, the great thing about this book is he just looks death in the face. That's all I'm going to say. If you need to do that, and you do, that's the book for you. Cancer Ward by Solzhenitsyn. He just looks at his own death in the face. And through it, he allows you to do that as well. Okay, next. Um, George MacDonald, a Scottish writer, a great influence on people like uh, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. And no, I'm not doing Lord of the Rings here, or Chronicles of Narnia, although both of those are, are very influential to me. But I, like I said, I didn't want to pull this off too far into that zone. But MacDonald, uh, as C.S. Lewis said, one of his, uh, his books, Fantasties, was an early uh, book of his that was, uh, it's essentially, I mean, there's a great scene in the beginning of it of this guy, he's looking through this, like, telescope, and he sees this shadow coming straight down here. I mean, Jung would have a field day with this sort of thing. The shadow comes to him, you know, but it's a it's a book of mysteries and and. It's an adult fairy tale, but not adult in the sense that people use the word today in that uh, X-rated sense, but adult in the sense of a mature fairy tale. 
Uh, Lewis said when he rep read that book, even before he was a Christian, it baptized his imagination. And MacDonald certainly was a Christian, uh, but of a very unique sort. Um, what MacDonald is often known for is children's stories. Um, so, for instance, uh, The Princess and the Goblin, The Princess and Curdy, Back of the North Wind. They're all great, and they have uh, amazing moments and scenes in them. Uh, but for my money, it's his fairy tales that are the height of what he does. And these are fairy tales that would work very much for reading to uh, children. Not super young children, but children, I'd say, you know, 7 to 12. I mean, hell, you can read them at the age of 90, and they're just as magical. And in fact, I've been thinking of doing something on fairy tales uh, coming up. Because one of the things I've been doing is I'm reading... Uh, this is Hans Christian Andersen's Complete Fairy Tales. I got a nice, cheap, but, but really quality leather-bound edition. Likewise, this is uh, Grimm's Fairy Tales, a complete and unedited version. Um, and this thing is blowing my mind. Uh, that's all I'm going to tell you right now. I mean, <laughs> you know, you've probably all heard of, uh, you know, the, the original Grimm's had, you know, uh, Hansel and Gretel and, you know, the, the head of the witch gets cut off and all this stuff. And it's really much, uh, different than the Disney type version. Well, yeah. But what's blowing my mind isn't the, the stories I already know. It's the ones I never heard before that sometimes are short. Like a, there's one story about a girl who has no hands. And it's just, I'm reading this, I'm going like Salvador Dali couldn't have come up with something more surreal than this. Uh, and there's quite a few of these old stories that are like this, or where the message is, both of these have, have stories that are just so bizarre. <laughs> so once I get, uh, you know, I'm kind of just picking and choosing these because they're short, uh, you know, one a night uh, from either or both of them as I'm uh about to drift off to sleep or something um but basically uh once i get far enough in it i will deal with that but also i'm i've got a uh parole fairy tales coming soon and he's uh the classic french fairy tales like uh, uh bluebeard Ooh, that's a scary one and uh beauty and the beast is in that one um but also i want to talk about George MacDonald's fairy tale. So at some point, it's probably going to be about a year from now, I'm going to do a, a, something as part of this book recommendation series on fairy tales, and uh, we'll go from there. Anyway, George MacDonald, fairy tales. I mean, just incredible, incredible stuff. The wise uh, woman, the light princess, and my favorite of all is the golden key. And the golden key, I often tell people, it's like a Christian version of Edgar Allan Poe that's just completely psychedelic and just mystical. Uh, the golden key is only about 20 pages long, and it is just the most amazing imagery. It's about love. It's about death. It's about heaven. It's about hell. And there's the three old men and all I can tell you is that the third old man is a baby. That's the kind of stuff George MacDonald is, is doing in this. It's incredible. Finally, we'll end with just mentioning Lilith by George MacDonald, which was the novel he wrote right near the end of his life, right before he went into about seven or eight years of just complete shutdown. And this was after his most beloved daughter died, Around the time uh, his wife would die soon thereafter, things were winding down for him. And in the 1890s, right at the beginning, he wrote this novel, Lilith. And people at the time said, oh, he's lost it. This, this book is just completely weird and such. This is my favorite novel of all time. Uh, Lilith is just the story. Well, Lilith, if you know your Hebrew mythology, was the first wife of Adam before Eve came along. That's in Hebrew mythology as opposed to simply the Bible. Um, Lilith is essentially a child of Satan, but this is about the redemption of Lilith. And there are just such bizarre 
beautiful, haunted. It, it is truly a, a frightening and beautiful book all at once. And that's, that's what I'm going to say about that right now. Well, as long as we are in the horror category, let's skip to someone who has nothing to do with Christianity and nothing to do with God. Or does he? He certainly has something to do with the old gods, and that's H.P. Lovecraft, which may strike you as weird uh, that I love H.P. Lovecraft so much, since of all the authors here, he's the only, like, totally dyed-in-the-wool atheist with some rather suspect views on race and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, a very strange, isolated, uh, neurotic man uh, who, well, I'm not going to go into his biography, but let's just say a very strange um, autodidact, you know. Um, so, uh, he crafted in all of his stories a, what's called the Cthulhu Mythos. And essentially what he did was kind of interwove all the short stories and novelettes and, and the couple of novels into one series of ideas. And what makes him so interesting to me is that he really is dealing with the other. He's really dealing with the fears of what if humanity is just some sort of huge mistake? What if we were just the spawn of alien races who care nothing about us? These kinds of ideas. And he creates these creatures like Cthulhu, which is this this large godlike creature who has like a almost like an octopus for a head, uh, the, and and it's this these these dark bubbling strange. Uh, he was fascinated with the unknown, and if you've seen movies like Alien or The Blob or um, uh, there was a movie, my favorite Lovecraft one is called Dagon. It's about these fish people, um, which is based on uh, the shadow of Innsmouth. Uh, that's all Lovecraftian stuff. Uh, John Carpenter's The Thing movie is totally Lovecraftian. And The Call of Cthulhu, I still, there is a one version of this as a movie, but I've still never seen anything to capture the weird and I truly mean weird in its original sense, uh, weird sense of, it's almost like the interweaving of different stories to create this mind-boggling sense of the world. Um, and it's, it's dark, it's absolutely nihilistic, uh, and somehow I like it. Why? Because unlike the kind of shallow nihilism of the present, Lovecraft, in a sense, wasn't afraid to go there. In a sense, he was uh, pretty honest to his convictions uh, and didn't see much meaning in the world. I would argue that he actually did, or else why would he write it all? But that's a long story. Uh, there's a short story called The Hound, which I particularly like because it really connects Lovecraft with the decadence and the symbolist era at the end of the uh, 19th century. And uh, I, last year I read uh, Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray and then followed it up with some Lovecraft reading uh, and read The Hound. And it just seemed like of the same world, of this decadent world. And of course in Lovecraft, it's all taken way too far into grave robbing, into, you know, un you know you know things that that should be unspoken never whispered and there is that aspect of our society that has continued on into the present you know whether it's performance art in new york city or movies that go way over the edge you know that people are still looking for that outer limit of experience and the hound really captures that sense and the curse of it and of course his novel at the mountains of madness which guillermo del toro has really wanted to make and i think a guillermo del toro version of that would be amazing and it's essentially about finding the ruins of a you know absolutely 
ancient civilization of these strange creatures in a hidden place in the Antarctic. And it's just a, a strange mood in the story, which, and that's what Lovecraft is great for, setting this mood. His writing style is very bizarre because he was in love with 18th century writing. But he wasn't an 18th century person, so he cobbled together something that was a combination of these, you know, he's often using words like fetid and loathsome and putrid and, you know, he's using all these descriptors that are, that are so, we don't use them in daily life anymore. But then they didn't use them at the beginning of the 20th century in daily life either. Well, he died relatively young. What was that around? 1930 something. But, uh, he never saw World War II come and hardly sold any of his stuff except to some pulp magazines before his death. And then later, afterwards, his friend August Derleth kind of championed his work and kept pushing, and eventually Lovecraft, you know, there's a American Library hardback version of Lovecraft's work. I mean, that's how important he's become. And when I was younger... Serious literary people would just poo-poo him and go like, ah, ah. But the more you get away from him, you know, whether it's people like Stephen King or Clive Barker or people who recognize a genuine talent, they would point at him and go like, yeah, Lovecraft. Uh, different is a British writer, uh, Richard Adams, who wrote uh, The Great Watership Down. And I think Watership Down is an absolutely astounding novel about rabbits. <laughs> and if you've never read it, if you're looking for a fantasy which is really wonderful, but isn't based on the kind of high fantasy dragons and elves sort of stuff that has unfortunately uh, clogged the marketplace, Watership Down is great. It's more in the line of, uh, you know, the Beatrix Potter books, except it's not written for children, although I think young teens would really like the book. But it is, uh, it's a dark book. It's about rabbits fighting each other. It's about rabbits being trapped and caught. It's about rabbits, it's about rabbits in their own 1984 world. <laughs> what an amazing thing. With all sorts of rabbit mythology and such. And connected to that in a certain sort of way is the book, The Plague Dogs, which takes place in the same world where animals talk to each other or, and, and are able to talk. The only, person the animals can't talk to is human beings. And uh, I recommend The Plague Dogs as well, about a couple of uh, dogs who escape uh, uh, a, a laboratory where they've been worked on and their brains are kind of messed up and still are all cut and such. Great. My other favorite novel by Richard Adams is Shardick, which is about a bear worshipped as a god in this ancient civilization. And it really harkens back to ancient Greece and things like that. And I think Shardik is, a, I mean, there are just scenes in that that just stay with you. Um, it's, it is uh, fantastic, kind of moving towards the high fantasy realm, and yet the, it's grounded in reality, very much in the way that Watership Down is. And following up on Shardik was another book called Maya, about a girl who ends up becoming a prostitute in this world. Although she's basically innocent, she's tortured, essentially, through being used and sold and such like that. And at the same time, she, she keeps her faith and uh, Richard Adams was an Anglican. Uh, you can kind of get that sense of belief, and yet he stays very faithful to the worlds he creates. So I recommend Richard Adams. And just to be totally predictable, I need to just mention G.K. Chesterton's The Man Who Was Thursday. His Fra Father Brown series is great, uh, but The Man Who Was Thursday is something else. There isn't another book like that. I would really love to see a great version of this story. It would have to be set at the uh, turn of the century when uh, Chesterton wrote it because of the imagery in there. And uh, it's just, it's, it's a comic fantasy that's also a spiritual fantasy. And essentially it's about... Uh, infiltrating a group of anarchists who have these 
conspiracies and plots that are trying to take over the world. And then what you find is that <laughs> all the anarchists are actually also spies trying to find out who the anarchists are. And then finally you come to the man who was Sunday, which is just this moment. It gives me a shiver when I get to the end of the book. And uh, it's, it's a one of a kind book. It's essentially in the, almost the mystery genre but there's just never been a book. I mean, just imagine Agatha Christie or, or uh, you know, Dorothy Sayers or one of these great English mystery writers writing a book that is absolutely cosmic. The Man Who Was Thursday. And finally, our last writer for this session of book recommendations is the great Fyodor Dostoevsky, who... I can't say enough about um, he as a writer to me he is the greatest uh, in terms of fiction I, I think for plays Shakespeare but for for uh, novels it's still Dostoevsky I think he's greater than Tolstoy it basically there are two kinds of people in the world there's Tolstoy people and there's Dostoevsky people and uh, I am definitely a Dostoevsky person I first read Crime and Punishment and I remember seeing a classics comic version of it, which, you know, the story is essentially about a man who is philosophically very nihilistic, says, well, everything essentially is invented. I can do whatever I want. It's a proto-Nietzschean idea. Uh, you know, it's like, and so he, he decides to murder someone. And then the there is a very wily police inspector who starts grilling him and is able to see through his psychological chinks in his armor. Now, the way the classics comic version of it went was that it ends with the guy catching him. But that's not the way the book ends at all. It does happen, but then there's a bunch more of the book to go. And it has to do with his redemption. That the book is not just about the psychology of a, of a man trapped in guilt with a bad philosophy, but it's also about him finding redemption through love. And if you haven't read Crime and Punishment, why? Notes from Underground. This is an incredible book. If you have never read any Dostoevsky, it's a good book to start with. It's short. It's divided into two uh, sections. The first section is this man giving you his ideas about the world. And in the second section, he then goes and demonstrates how he lives, we'll say. I'm not going to give anything away about the second section. But it's the first section that is absolutely crucial. Because in it, Dostoevsky essentially starts talking about our world. This is the thing about Dostoevsky. When, uh, right now, I'm just reading, for the first time, it was the only book I hadn't read by him, uh, Demons, which is some kind, sometimes called The Possessed or The Devils. But uh, in Russian, the best translation is Demons. And so I'm reading that. I'm halfway through it right now. And uh, it has all the great stuff that I love about Dostoevsky. You know, I've read so much of his work. <clears throat> and... Um, but Dostoevsky is, is incredible for his use of psychology. And as he would call it, it's psychology. It's not, it's not Freudian psychology. These books are written before Freud, before Jung. Both Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn were orthodox. And it shines through in their work in very subtle and very strong ways at different times. And Dostoevsky's ability to penetrate the human psyche and to see that he has no characters that are black and white in his books. They are all filled with uh, ambiguities. And even the, the best characters seem flawed and the worst characters have aspects of them that make you respect them. And you know what? This is exactly the world we live in. That's why Dostoevsky is so great. 
uh, Dostoevsky takes the the view of the Bible on humanity, that we are both good and bad, weaves them together within his own tragic history. And the story of Dostoevsky is amazing as well. And in a sense, he comes to a sense of res uh, redemption and resolution in his own life by the end. And all I can tell you is that uh, to read him is something. And of course, his greatest work, and I think most people would agree with this, is the Brothers Karamazov, which deals with uh, three different brothers who are brothers from different fathers. And he brings it together in such a way the great story of the Grand Inquisitor is found in this novel. And that has been... In, people have wondered what that all means, uh, that chapter. And what Dostoevsky has done is put his strongest argument against Christianity in the mouth of a murderer, which is really fascinating. Um, at the same time, the, 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 the other brother, Alyosha, who is uh, the, the innocent, much like uh, the character in The Idiot, uh, is someone who resonates with a deep sense of meaning in life. And in the end, it is Alyosha who, whose view permeates uh, the book. So I highly recommend it. It's a long book. You don't start with it, whatever you do. Start with Notes from the Underground. He's other, got other short works as well, like The Gambler, The Double, these sorts of things. Good place to start. Then move straight to Crime and Punishment. I would say read Demons Next. It's great. And then eventually you can... The Idiot is slower, but I still recommend it. But I, uh, you know, graduate to the Brothers Karamazov. So that's it. A few books that have meant a lot to me in my life. And if you know their works, uh, why don't you, you know, tell me what, you, what works by them you like. Or, you know, talk about the books that have meant something to you in the comments. Go ahead and mention a few books that if you were going to recommend a few books to people randomly, uh, you would do that. Don't recommend them to me. I've got way too many books. <laughs> I, I've got enough books for like two years sitting on my shelves here because I'm always reading. Although every now and then someone can convince me of something new to read. I'm just a real hard sell. If someone says, oh, you've really got to read this new book by somebody, I'm going like, why? They go, I don't want to spoil it for you. I'm never going to read it unless you spoil it for me. That's, oh, that's, it's just that, that true. You got to give me a good reason why. And in order to do it, you're going to have to spoil it. Because I don't care about spoilers. So, uh, anyway, how we got here, number 11, coming up hopefully within a week. Meanwhile, here's a little video for you. Yeah, my short video. What is this? Half hour, 40 minutes long? I'll see you very soon. This is Burn in Tbilisi telling you to swim against the stream, especially in these days. A people, a people without, without history, history is not, not redeemed, redeemed from time. For history, history is a pattern of timeless time moments. moments. criminal now is the entirely lawless modern philosopher. Compared to him, burglars and bigamists are essentially moral men. My heart goes out to them. They accept the essential ideal of man, they merely seek it wrongly. Thieves respect property. They merely wish the property to become their property, that they may more perfectly respect it. But philosophers dislike property as property. 
They wish to destroy the very idea of personal possession. Bigamists respect marriage, or they would not go through the highly ceremonial formality of bigamy. But philosophers despise marriage as marriage. Murderers respect human life. They merely wish to attain a greater fullness of human life in themselves by the sacrifice of what seems to them to be lesser lives. But philosophers hate life itself. <laughs>